So I'm delighted to be asked to come along and talk to you about this very important subject, the subject of motivation. Um, just to tell you a bit about myself, I'm a consultant psychiatrist. I've worked in the National Health Service as a psychiatrist uh, for many years. Uh, but from about 2010, I moved into private practice in Harley Street. I've been a senior lecturer as well at academic institutions like the Institute of Psychiatry. So when people hear now that I work purely in private practice in Harley Street, I know what they think. They think, oh, all he does all day is see nothing but supermodels and actresses. Well, it's a tough job, but <laughs> someone's got to do it. So up until now, you've been given talks by lovely, kind, gentle people. I'm afraid that's all about to change. I need to tell you a little bit about my style, which will become very apparent very rapidly, which is I'm a very irritating guy to be in a room with. I am provocative, I'm challenging, and I strongly suspect that you will, by the end of this, be thoroughly annoyed and upset with many of the things that I've said. And I'm, I'm really sorry about that. I'm honestly sorry about that. At least I've apologized about it before it actually happens, which I believe demonstrates that I have insight into myself. And after all, insight is the important thing. Though my many, many psychotherapists have said this is just a rationalization for my bad behavior. But I will defend myself further by saying at least an irritated audience is an awake audience. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I am gonna say many things that are gonna upset you and there'll be time for you to challenge me back. And that's the kind of uh, dynamic uh, that we're likely to have where uh, you are confused or, or, or upset by some of the things uh, that I'm saying. But I'm also believing that in provoking and challenging you, I am doing something more productive than just telling you something uh, you already know. Um, and I, I'm gonna say that many of the things that you believe about the psychology of motivation are probably wrong. And I'm going to um, spend the next couple of uh, hours um, disinterring uh, some of that stuff. So just to give you a sense of my style, I work in, in psychiatry in Harley Street. I see obviously all the things that psychiatrists see, but I see also people who are interested in elite performance, elite athletes, people who don't have any psychiatric illness but are functioning at a very, very high level in their careers and they, they want to take it to the next level. But I also, for example, do a lot of marital therapy and a lot of couple counseling. And just to give you a sense of my style, many couples who come to see me who are, are looking for couple therapy, and they normally think couple therapy is about a couple therapist working very hard to try and keep them together, they are, they are somewhat startled and shocked when at an alarmingly early stage of having only just met them, I will suddenly hold my hand up and say, um, I just need to stop you right there, this marriage is over. <laughs> Get out now, is my advice, rather than stay constantly fighting with each other. And, and, and people are upset and disturbed that a marital therapist should, you know, give the, give the last rights uh, to uh, their relationship so uh, early on. And we then, the, the consultation moves into what I call the Monty Python dead parrot sketch. <laughs> I don't know if you know the Monty Python dead parrot sketch, but in the sketch, a man buys a parrot from a pet shop, takes it home, and then discovers it's a dead parrot. <laughs> so he's upset and takes the parrot back to the pet shop owner in an attempt to get his money back. And there ensues a fight between the pet shop owner and the guy who's bought the dead parrot. The guy who's bought the dead parrot keeps saying, look, it's a dead parrot. It's been nailed to the perch. It's dead and gone to meet its maker. And the pet shop owner just refuses to accept it's a dead parrot. He says, no, Norwegian blue, blue beautiful plumage, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we do the dead parrot sketch in my marital therapy counseling. I say, this is a dead marriage. It's died and gone to heaven. And they say, no, 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 beautiful plumage. They keep... Now, a very interesting thing then happens, which is having been at war with each other up until the time they come to see me. And sometimes people are so much at war with each other that my receptionist will call me in the middle of a consultation and say, listen, the couple that you're about to see in an hour's time have arrived early. Do you mind seeing them early? Because I'm having a fight here in reception and it's, it's disturbing the other patients. Um, so um, 
people have been at war with each other, suddenly, when a therapist like me says, listen, this, this marriage is over, they're very upset with me, and it, it galvanizes them to come together for the first time. How dare this man say our marriage is over? And for the very first time, they bond in irritation with me. We'll prove him wrong. Um, so, very interestingly, maybe there's a subtle manipulative technique involved in galvanizing people's motivation. And we're going to be discussing some of those uh, paradoxical uh, techniques. But another very interesting thing happens, which is that very often when two people go to a marital therapist, one of them doesn't actually want it to work and doesn't think it's going to work. They're just playing time out to wait for the other person to realize that the marriage has got no chance of working. Okay? So they're just coming along because they're going through the motions and they don't want to upset the other person by actually saying what I say. Uh, and what happens very interesting when I announce, I'm sorry, this is a dead marriage. One person gets very voluble and upset and tries to defend the marriage. The other person goes really quiet. It's really interesting. Uh, and that person who's gone quiet is actually going quiet because I'm saying what they're thinking and I'm verbalizing it. So that, that comes to another really interesting thing about motivation, which is that I think, particularly in Britain today, it's the most taboo subject. People think sex is taboo. Motivation is way more taboo. In Britain today, you are not really allowed to be open and honest about your ambition about what you want in life. Uh, in America, you can go to a middle-class dinner party and people can say quite happily, uh, I want to be the next Zuckerberg. I want to be worth a billion. And Americans don't blink an eye at this kind of naked ambition. Um, uh, an American athlete wins Wimbledon or some uh, uh, sporting event, and at the press conference afterwards, uh, they're completely open about their naked ambition. Yeah, I thought I deserved to win. You know, I did more training and, and so on than the other guy. When a British athlete wins anything, uh, they apologize and, <laughs> and they go, I, I got lucky on the day, right? So in Britain, you're not allowed at a middle class dinner party to say, I'm really driven to make lots of money. You're not allowed to be open about your ambition. I was brought up um, uh, in a, a small island called Barbados and I arrived at the age of nine and I was perplexed by this thing that the English do, which is obscure and hide their motivation. So I turned up outside the exam hall. Um, I'm a very motivated guy. I studied very hard. And I was perplexed by every single English student said, oh, I did no work at all. I'm probably going to fail. And I was just amazed. They all seemed to be doing really well with their exam results, despite never owning up to doing any work. No one in Britain outside an exam hall says, listen, I work all the hours that God sends. OK, they are not honest. So. It's really interesting because I think we are warping and distorting our ability to think about motivation because no one's honest. No one's honest about what they really want. Man meets an attractive woman in a bar, starts to chat her up. He's not honest. He doesn't say, my plan to sleep with you tonight. <laughs> and th there's obviously a reason why in that situation it would be wise to obscure your motivation. But, but think very hard about the last time People were honest with you, or you were honest with people, or even had an honest conversation about why you do what you do, and why you want what you want, and what you really want. And actually, because motivation is a difficult subject to get to the bottom of it, it's useful to have a conversation, it's why people come to a therapist, to think hard about what you really want. So we've just had a new Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. I've never heard an interviewer ask anyone like Boris, why do you want to be Prime Minister? To me, it's the most blindingly obvious question. Why do you do what you do? When people go to a therapist, I've been working as a psychiatrist now for many decades, very rarely does a patient say, why do you want to be a psychiatrist? Why do you do what you do? It's the million dollar question. It's a very good question to start off a therapy session with. Um, and again, I understand it's tricky. It's difficult when the plumber arrives to say, why do you do plumbing? <laughs> okay. um, of course, the honest answer for most people's jobs is, I hate my job, I just do it to pay the rent. And that's not really a good starting point to whether you're going to get a good uh, plumbing experience with the plumber. 
Okay, so I'm going to tell you a true story about myself, and then I need to warn you that throughout my talk, I'm going to be doing little psychological tests on you. These tests will involve me telling you a short story, then asking you a question about the story. So it's very important you pay attention to the story. Uh, this first story isn't one of those, so you can relax a little bit uh, on this one. But the, uh, just to warn you, the other stories coming up involve a hidden uh, psychological test. So this is a true story. Um, when I was a medical student, um, being a very ambitious medical student, I wasn't looking forward to the surgical firm. The surgical firm is where you, as a group of eight medical students, are attached to a surgeon. Things have all changed now, but this is way back in the, in the early 1980s when this is how it worked. And you followed this surgeon around, you were like an apprentice, and you went around each bed, uh, and he asked you questions, and you hung out with him day and night, sometimes when he was on call, etc. Et he was a wise old man, you sat at his feet, and uh, you, you learned uh, from him. And the, these guys were, were um, accused today of being arrogant, um, but they were tough people because they, they seemed to spend a lot of time humiliating you in front of the other students. They would make fun of the fact you didn't seem to know anything. Today, that, that's all changed and you can get kicked out of university if you humiliate a student. But back then, it was the main way uh, doctors taught um, uh, medical students. Anyway, so I wasn't looking forward to the surgical firm. I'd arrived at medical school already resolved to being a psychiatrist. So all the blood and gut stuff of surgery and anatomy and so on, I wasn't uh, very uh, keen on and not very good at it. But I was ambitious. I wanted to uh, do well. And so in a fit of medical student ambition and went out and bought at HK Lewis, which was a very famous medical textbook shop. It's closed now, but it was only a few hundred yards away from here. Um, the biggest, fattest surgical textbook I could find. And it's called, and it's still, I think, running through a, yet another edition uh, today, it's called Bailey and Love's Shorter Practice of Surgery. Now, I think the term shorter is meant a bit ironically because it's a huge book. If this book falls off a shelf and lands on someone, they don't get up and walk away. In fact, after having bought the book in, in H.K. Lewis um, in a fit of medical student ambition, I, had to, I tried to lift the book up and realized I wasn't going to make it all the way to Archway, so I had to hire a minicab to help me get the book home. So my medical student friends I was sharing the flat with helped lever the book, because uh, it took a lot of people to move the book up to the top shelf above my desk, and there the book lay undisturbed <laughs> as the months rolled by and the surgical firm approached till we come to the night before the surgical firm is due to begin around 11 p.m. I decide I better take a look at this book. <laughs> I think I have to wake up my flatmates to help get the book down. I open the first page, and this is absolutely true. If you look at Bailey and Love's Shorter Practice of Surgery back a few editions ago, on the flyleaf cover where it announces, this is called Bailey and Love's Shorter Practice of Surgery, there's a wood engraving of a woman who I think is called the widow of New Orleans. It dates from 18 something. And this poor woman has a horrible growth growing out of her forehead. So she looks a bit like a unicorn. And uh, underneath there's a little motto, it says, widow of New Orleans, uh, St. Orleans, um, 1746, uh, sebaceous horn. So this is obviously a sebaceous cyst or a, a something like that, which has just grown into enormous proportions because back 200 years ago, there wasn't surgical treatment for this stuff. And throughout Bailey and Love's book, they, they seem to delight these two surgeons who used to work at the Royal Northern uh, Hospital in Highgate. They used to delight in traveling the world, taking black and white pictures of people um, harboring enormous gross pathology that grown to enormous proportions because wherever they were, uh, there was no surgery. So you've got pictures of people wheeling their hernia around in a wheelbarrow because the hernia has grown to such enormous um, size. But anyway, I didn't get that far into it, but I just got to the flyleaf cover. I saw this wood engraving picture, widow of New Orleans, 1746, sebaceous horn. I looked at the picture and promptly fell asleep. <laughs> I woke up the next morning, slumped over the textbook. I think I may have dribbled on it. And uh, I, I, was, I woke up with some alarm because I was meant to be at the Whittington Hospital for the opening outpatient clinic of Mr. Locke. Mr. Locke is a very fearsome surgeon. He's got the worst reputation for humiliating medical students and not suffering fools. I dash into the Whittington. The nurses are extremely alarmed by the fact I've arrived late and the normal procedure is you're meant to see a patient and spend an hour 
clerking them in, uh, getting their history, examining them, and then Mr. Lott will arrive, and you're meant to present the case, and you're meant to know everything there is to know about the patient. And even then, Mr. Lott still tears you apart because he finds stuff that you don't know. So um, they are very alarmed because I've only just arrived. Mr. Lock is about to arrive. They, they say, listen, go into that room. There's a, the first patient in that room. Do your best to see and, and talk to them about as much as you can. You've only got a few minutes. Mr. Locke's about to arrive. We'll stall him out here, giving you a chance. I, I, I became even more panicky at their alarm because they were obviously very worried about what was about to happen. So I went into the room. I just had a chance to glimpse an elderly woman sitting quietly in a corner. And all I had a chance to do was observe she had a small bump on her forehead. <laughs> when Mr. Locke rushed in, flapping white coat, about 4,000 research fellows, medical students coming in behind him. He walked over to the desk, started shuffling papers on his desk. Did the thing I see, and there's a lot of surgeons do. Didn't make any eye contact with me and just barked out a, a question. I, I, it took me a while to realize the question was addressed to me. He barked, he's look at, looking down at the face. He said, right then, what's the diagnosis? Now you've got to understand a couple of things about this moment. First of all, I'm the most disorganized medical student in the country. I know no surgery. I didn't make it past the flyleaf cover of Bailey and Loves. So I was forced to say at this moment, the only diagnosis I knew in surgery. <laughs> and I knew I was in trouble, but I still said it with a fair amount of confidence, but a kind of like lilt at the end, which suggested it was like a question. I said, a uh, sebaceous horn? <laughs> now, this answer didn't just seem to be wrong. It seemed to galvanize paroxysms of rage from deep within Mr. Locke. He turned and he scolded the other medical students. They had done nothing wrong yet. He said, how many times have I told you? Don't say these random diagnoses. I mean, sebaceous horn, it's incredibly rare. That's such a mad thing to say. I've been a general adult surgeon for 30 years. I've only ever seen one case. How many times have I told you? Say common things. He was beginning to shout at me. He glanced over at the patient, then glanced back at me. And another thing, and then he stopped mid-sentence, and then did a double take. <laughs> and had another look at the patient. And he said, my God, I think you're right. <laughs> he went over, he examined the patient, and lo and behold, it was one of those one in a billion chances. It just so happened, it actually was a sebaceous horn. The second case Mr. Locke had seen in his whole career. At this moment, I was transformed in his eyes into some kind of surgical prodigy <laughs> that I had on my very first day, with only seeing the patient for a few minutes, made a diagnosis he'd only ever seen once before. So Mr. Lott held me in awe and reverence. I was kind of like the prodigy he'd always been hoping and praying would eventually come along. <laughs> And so we would sit around, he would, the eight, eight medical students would go through the ward, we would sit around the, stand around the, the bed, and he would bark out a question, right, what are the causes of this kind of liver disease? Uh, not Raj, because he'll know the answer. Which <laughs> came as news to me, because usually, I didn't know the answer. Um, but I've got to tell you something, when eight other medical students have had a go at answering a question, um, you've got a much better chance by the time it comes round to you to not say something quite so silly. So it became a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. Because he'd wait right to the end, and all the other eight students had had their answers machine-gunned by uh, Mr. Lott, I kind of knew what not to say. So I wouldn't say the really stupid things the other eight had said. So I always said something, as far as Mr. Lott was concerned, was actually very intelligent. So. It became a self-fulfilling prophecy, and it kind of reinforced his view that I was this kind of surgical genius. And, and it became a, a, a while that we were like an old married couple. Um, as the medical students were giving their terrible answers, we'd, go, we'd, we'd look at each other and go, cuh, cuh, cuh. <laughs> Medical students today, I just don't know. And uh, uh, after um, uh, this, this firm, Mr. Locke, 
Um, I would hear him discussing me with his colleagues, because, you know, I was this apprentice he'd always been looking for. I would hear them discuss in hushed tones at the end of the ward, while the medicals at the other end, they, they would look up and look at me in reverence, and Miss Lot would go, I could overhear the conversation and go, Sebaceous Horn made the diagnosis. Just like that. <laughs> Didn't even give me a differential diagnosis. You know, what else was possible? He was that confident. He was right. <laughs> right, so... Um, one of the really interesting things about that story, which is a true story, and by the way, it's how I ended up doing the, surg the professorial surgical house job, which is what the career surgeons do. Um, they were very upset at the end of the six months when I announced I was going to be a psychiatrist. I've got to tell you, they were. Uh, anyway, so what's interesting about me buying the textbook right there is an example of a thing that you see at the heart of the problem of motivation. People always do a bit, right? They do a bit towards the thing they're trying to be motivated for, but they never do enough. They never do nearly enough. I did a bit, I went and bought the book, but then I didn't go and look at the book, okay? So everyone's doing a bit. No one's never doing nothing. No one ever says, listen, I don't understand why I'm failing. I never study at all. No one ever says that, okay? People always go, well, I'm studying really hard. Why am I not passing? It's because you're not doing enough. It's not that difficult, but here's the point. Why is it people think they're doing enough? Why did I think buying the textbook would be enough as opposed to actually studying the thing? So that's one of the things, subjects we're going to be tackling. But I want you to notice something, that how much of motivation is about the show? Maybe I went and bought the book and I'm showing to myself and other people that I'm motivated. But how much of motivation is really the secret stuff you do that's beyond the show when you actually work hard and study to the extent that no one can see? So one of the problems is that unmotivated people are always thinking they're doing enough. Okay, and they're always exhausted by the amount they're doing. Really motivated people believe they're never doing enough. They're working all the hours that God sends. They wake up in the morning and run 10 miles, but they still don't think they're doing enough. If you think you're doing enough, right there I can tell you it's highly likely you're not what we would call in psychology and psychiatry a highly motivated person. So to unpack that now, I'm going to come to the first uh, little test that I want to do, which means I'm going to tell you a little story I want you to pay attention to the story because I am going to ask you a question afterwards. Now, in all the talks I've given over all the years, all over the world, no one has ever got the question right. Maybe you'll be the first group that get the answer to the question. But the answer to the question, the correct answer, unpacks a deep point about the psychology of motivation and, and, and illustrates a kind of thing that people often get wrong, which is fundamental about the psychology of motivation. So pay attention to the story because the answer is actually embedded in the story. After I do the test and I ask people the question and then we have a fight because I tell you the correct answer, people always say um, uh, they didn't think um, uh, they, 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 they thought the question was a bit unfair. Then I point out that actually the answer is right there in the story and they tend to accept that and they go a bit quiet. So let's, let's pay attention to the story, okay? Because the answer's in the story. It's a true story. So the story goes like this. In May 2000, a uh, lottery that was shared across seven different states in the USA that's called the Big Game had uh, rolled over sat week after week without being won, so that the uh, total sum of money by May 2000 that was available to be the won with the purchase of a single $1 lottery ticket had reached the giddy sum of 350 million US dollars. Now, many of you know that I, I write the occasional book and I, I embrace Zen Buddhist philosophy, which is a non-materialistic philosophy, and that's often in, in books in psychology and psychiatry these days. But even Zen Buddhist monks have been known to go a little weak at the knees at the thought of 350 million US dollars. And historically, this was the biggest sum that any lottery anywhere in the world had ever reached, which we could buy or win with the purchase of a single $1 lottery ticket. The, the draw is due to be held on the evening of May the 9th. On the evening of May the 8th, Stephen and Pat Roberts, a very ordinary lower middle class couple, in, living in the Detroit suburbs, are watching the TV news, the local TV news, while they're having their dinner. And uh, the thing you've got to know about Stephen and Pat Roberts is they never play the lottery. And Stephen and Pat Roberts have done statistics at college and fancy themselves as highly rational people with a mathematical acumen. And so they think it's stupid and irrational and the height of human irrationality that people go and buy lottery tickets. And should you have the temerity 
to mention you've bought a lottery ticket while you are near Stephen and Pat Roberts at a party, let's say, they will turn on you and spend the rest of the evening demonstrating mathematically how mad you were to go and buy the ticket. Pat has a favorite saying, uh, it's irrational and mad to buy the lottery because you actually, statistically speaking, have more chances of striking oil in your backyard than winning a big money prize. And you don't go digging for oil, do you? So me having told you this very important information about Stephen and Pat Roberts, I think you can take a wild guess as to where this story is heading. So on the evening of May the 8th, the draw is due to be held on May the 9th. Stephen and Pat Roberts are watching uh, the uh, TV news. And the big news in the local TV news is that there are queues around the block, anywhere in the Detroit near area that sells lottery tickets. Because people are aware that the giddy sum that the, the lottery prize has reached, and they're rushing out the last minute to buy another ticket. And because of that, the jackpot price keeps going up and up. And as a result of that, more people rush out and buy a ticket and we're in a vicious spiral upwards. And the TV news camera crews are panning across the extended queues as people queue to go and rush and buy a ticket. And as they're looking at these queues, Pat suddenly turns to Stephen. Pat suddenly turns to Stephen and says, you know, Stephen, $350 million is a lot of money. And I'm just wondering if you have a spare moment tomorrow, why don't you get a lottery ticket? Well, Stephen's absolutely flabbergasted at Pat's complete 180 degree turn. But he knows, as all spouses do, that no matter what mad and strange thing your partner says to you, you must maintain a zen-like calm <laughs> and just agree. He's a bit nervous, though, because he sees the big queues and he's got a very busy day. He works in a swimming pool refurbishment, has his own swimming pool refurbishment business, and he's got a busy day tomorrow. He's, he's not got the time to go and queue uh, for a ticket. But he just assents uh, to Pat's request. The next morning they wake up. They've even forgotten about the conversation they had about the lottery. They have a rushed breakfast. Stephen uh, rushes out. He's driving a pickup truck. He's going around collecting orders for his swimming pool refurbishment business. We get to around lunchtime. He gets a bit hungry, decides he's going to have a hot dog and Coke, pulls in uh, uh, on the high street where he sees a store, a general store that sells hot dogs and Cokes, goes into the store, is about to buy the hot dog and Coke when he notices that the store doesn't just sell hot dogs and Cokes, it also sells lottery tickets. And magically enough, there is no queue. He remembers his wife's injunction for the night before and excitedly reaches into his wallet to buy a lottery ticket, but discovers he only has a single $100 bill. And rather irritatingly, the man behind the checkout refuses to make change. Stephen's a bit of a quandary. He doesn't want to go home without having bought a lottery ticket. He knows it's very unlikely he's going to hit another store where there is no queue. So in a mad impulse, he says to the man behind the checkout, OK, I tell you what, I'll buy the hot dog for a dollar. I'll buy the Coke for a dollar. Give me the change in lottery tickets. So from never having bought a lottery ticket in his life, <laughs> on his first outing, he buys 98. He stuffs the lottery tickets into his coat pocket and rushes off, has the hot dog and coke, carries on driving around the Detroit suburbs, taking his swimming pool refurbishment orders. They get home, gets home quite late in the evening. They're quite tired. They have a, a rush dinner. They go to bed. They don't watch the draw on TV that night. They wake up the next morning and uh, they're having breakfast and the TV is on in the kitchen. And uh, the big news on the local TV news is that someone somewhere in the Detroit area has scooped a jackpot prize of $290 million. But mysteriously enough, that person has not rung in yet to claim the prize. There's a bit of a news vacuum when you haven't got a lucky winner. So the, uh, the, the news channel's got to fill the story somehow. And the technology available to the lottery company allows them to know where the winning ticket was bought. So the TV news camera crews have converged on the store that sold the winning ticket. And they're interviewing the guy behind the checkout who sold the winning ticket. And all of a sudden, Steve looks a bit more closely at the TV set and says, you know, Pat, that guy looks a lot like the guy who sold me my ticket. Their eyes lock across the <laughs> breakfast table. Stephen rushes over to his jacket, unearths the tickets, and lo and behold, they have that winning $290 million ticket. Anyone here will know what's the first thing the lottery company says when you ring in to claim a big money prize. By big, 
I mean, well over a million. Anyone knows what the lottery company says? The first thing? So, so no one here has actually won then? Because <laughs> I was hoping to make my career in the stress of sudden wealth. Uh, anyone want to have a go? Don't lose it. Don't lose it? Yeah, very good, very good. That is the first thing they say. A lot of people say, they say congratulations, but no, they say, whatever you do, don't lose it. And, and right there you know that means someone somewhere has managed to lose the ticket between ringing up to claim the prize and going in uh, to actually uh, show the ticket, because you've got to show the ticket. Could you imagine having that conversation with your spouse? Excuse me, darling, have you seen that $290 million ticket? Because I can't find it. Okay, now here, I hope you've been paying attention to the story because here comes the test question. Every week, this is a true story, every week since May 2000, Stephen and Pat Roberts have gone out and bought a single lottery ticket. They do it, you could even say, religiously. They go out and buy a single lottery ticket. They won $290 million, they never played the lottery before, now they go out every week and buy a single lottery ticket. Here's the question coming your way, why? Why do they do that? Anyone want to have a punt? Sir? Because they lost the original ticket on the turn <laughs> <laughs> Good thought. No, no, I said they have won $290 million. They're $290 million to the, the richer. The chance of them winning twice is less than it is winning once. The chances are win of winning twice are chances of winning. Why do you, why do you say that? You, you may be right statistically. I, I don't think you are, but why do you no, say that? I Okay. Uh, the chances of anybody else they know winning it ever again is, is, is very is even higher than them winning it again. Okay. It's well, odd, yes. well, well, I think their chances of them winning it a second time are higher if they've rigged the lottery and they know someone in the company. But I, I don't honestly think that's the reason why they're doing it. I don't think their chances are higher. But you may be right. I'm not sure. But I don't think that's the reason they're doing it. Do you want to have a go? Okay, so let me repeat that in case people didn't hear it at the back. Sorry, I meant to repeat the questions. I forgot that bit, which is that they had a positive experience, this gentleman's saying, and we call this in psychology reinforcement theory. Uh, uh, it's the oldest motivational theory there is in psychology, and it's still dominant. Um, and that's why I'm about to take it apart. <laughs> so uh, uh, the idea is they had a positive experience, i.e. they had a positive benefit, and that has now reinforced their behavior. So what you see if you reinforce the behavior of a rat in a maze, you give them a, 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 a positive experience, they repeat the behavior. Um, and so that, that all makes some logical sense, right? Um, there's a deep, deep flaw, which goes to the flaw at the heart of many academic psychological thinking, which is that, yes, certain things are reinforcers. Food is a reinforcer. Money is a reinforcer. Certain rewarding things are reinforcers, but they're only reinforcers as long as you are in a need state for that reinforcer. So if you've not eaten for a, a day, and I offer you some food as a reward for a task, you are very motivated to have that meal. If I've just given you a large 12 course dinner, right, and I try to motivate you by saying, if you do this thing for me, I'm gonna give you a really amazing meal right now, you're not motivated anymore. You have no need state for food, okay? So reinforcement theory only works, and that's why it's distorted the way psychologists think about motivation, because in laboratories, they generated the need state. They starved the rats, and then they gave the rats food. Well, yeah, the rats were really motivated. But how much time in the world is it the case, and this is a key point about motivation, motivation is a dynamic thing. Your motivation changes almost by moment to moment. And that's why science and psychology have been so weak at getting, getting a handle on it. Psychology is very good at handling things that are stable. I'll, I'll get to the other questions in a minute, because other answers, because I've got their hands up. But IQ, IQ is very stable, intelligence quotient. Whether you believe in it or not, um, a lot of psychologists in the intelligence measuring industry believe in it. If I was to measure all of your IQs, don't get alarmed, I won't do it today, and then re-measured it in six months later, it would be remarkably stable. 
Okay, that's a powerful construct that you can do science on because you've got hold of something now that you can investigate. If I was to measure your motivation today, let's say to eat or to study and then come back in six months time, it's highly likely not to be quite so stable. So reinforcement theory, trying to motivate your children by offering them stuff that you think they'll find rewarding, is unlikely to work unless they are in a chronic deficiency state that drives them to want that stuff, okay? So here's the flaw with the reason why most people say they buy a ticket, which is they had a really positive experience. Yes, they had a positive experience. They're now worth $290 million. Money is no longer a reinforcer to Stephen and Pat Roberts. And what's really interesting, challenging and irritating thing I wanna say, is how difficult people find to think about other people's motivation. You and I are still motivated by money because we haven't got $290 million. I've had, I meet many very high net worth individuals in my practice. I've got to tell you something. The one thing that does not motivate Stephen and Pat Roberts now is money. Because they got $290 million. What are they going to do with the extra $5 million they can't do with the first $290 million? And we find it quite difficult to think about other people who are not motivated by what we're motivated by. Okay, so that's a key point. The one thing Stephen and Pat Roberts are not buying a ticket for is because they need the money or want the money or are chasing that particular experience. Um, sorry, again, I hope it wasn't too irritating in the way that I um, came down on your answer. Um, let's go, let's have another go here. Okay, well, let's just gentlemen first then you. Yeah, you, you go ahead. Yeah, okay, so I don't know if people heard that at the back. It's, again, correct me if I got your, your answer wrong, but it's about, a, they, they, there was a moment of team, working as a team or their relationship, yeah. which led to the buying of the ticket, yeah. and they're trying to remind themselves yeah. or, or rekindle this kind of yeah. experience. Okay, um, not, not a bad answer, but I don't think that's what Stephen and Pat Roberts would say. You, you wanted to have a go, sir. Um, yeah, I think most people uh, probably play the lottery for many, many times without winning, and then finally they do win. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> when you win on the first go, you might be an obligation to, to try and repay that by continuing to Ah, this is a very interesting answer. A lot of people give this answer. So you're in firm ground in terms of it's a widely held theory. So for people who didn't hear at the back, this gentleman's saying, and again, I'm paraphrasing what you said. It was correct me if I get it wrong, that maybe because they know most people play the lottery for years and never win, and they had the temerity to go and play once and won big, maybe they feel a bit uneasy about that. Maybe they feel guilty. And your argument is they're trying to maybe pay the money back. One dollar at a time. That's... <laughs> That's my problem uh, with that uh, theory. Uh, yeah, it makes them feel better to buy a ticket one dollar at a time when you're worth 290 million. Uh, not a huge amount of guilt there, I think. But, but that argument is not an unusual argument. But I want you to notice something before we go any further. Can you see how people are thinking about motivation? What's driving them in the way they think? Okay, um, and I want, what I'm trying to do is help you improve the way you think about motivation. And one of the ways to improve it is be aware of all the possibilities. People tend to gallop to one possibility very quickly. Anytime you're dealing with anyone, come up with five or six possibilities, because it will enlarge and make it more likely you'll get the motivation right. People only ever come up with one motivation. I do a lot of consultancy work for, for senior managers in, in top firms in the city, and I say, uh, they got team problems. I first question, I say, this person you're, you're worried about is not doing so well, why do they come to work? And the first answer I get is because they want the money. Yes, but why do they want the money? And they, I get a blank look. You know, why does anyone want money? Well, it varies. Maybe he wants to collect Ferraris. I don't know. Maybe he's worried about his wife leaving him and he's got an expensive divorce on his hands. There are different reasons and it leads to different motivations. So one tip is be aware there's a multiplicity of possible motivations. Okay, let's take a few more. We're running out of time and I'll, then I'll give you the answer. Um, uh, let's go right at the back. There's a person right at the back there. Okay, the loyalty and support for the system. That's a little bit like the guilt theory uh, down here. Again, loyalty and support for the system, one dollar at a time, uh, once a week. I, 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 I find that a very strange um, expression for loyalty. Okay, this gentleman's very keen to have a go. Yes. So he's actually carrying out the command of the wife originally asked him to 
Oh, I like that answer. Yes. <laughs> did, you, did everyone hear that answer? He's trying to carry out the initial command of the wife. Um, uh, you might get lucky tonight in a bar, given that answer you've just given. Um, <laughs> so listen, uh, we're running out of time. I, I'd love to hear all your other answers, but I'm going to give you a hard time now. I did warn you the kind of therapist I am, which is I give people a hard time, okay? Listen to the story. What was in the story? Again, were you listening to the story or were you immediately leaping to your theories about motivation? There was only one thing I actually told you about Stephen and Pat Roberts. What was the one thing I told you? I told you something about their belief system. Their belief system is it's stupid to play the lottery because you've got no chance of winning. That's the only thing I told you about Stephen and Pat Roberts. So if they have changed in some way and they're now buying a ticket, which is a change, that's the key change we're discussing. It's an enigma because a change has occurred. They never bought a ticket before, now they're buying a ticket. I expect you to start thinking, I'm showing you the pathway by which you should be thinking, which is what do we know about Stephen and Pat Roberts? Well, the only thing I told you, so sorry, I've got to give you a hard time here. It's not like I had a lot of different things to think about about Stephen and Pat Roberts, was their belief system. So any answer you give me about motivation has got to inhabit the territory of belief system. What is their belief system and how has it changed? Again, I want you to think hard about whether you were thinking that way, okay? So their belief system was, statistically speaking, rationally speaking, it makes no point playing the lottery. So something must have changed there. Maybe because they had this experience of winning the lottery, and actually they will tell you this privately if you speak to them, uh, on the first time, they don't believe that they are subject to the rules of probability in the way the rest of us are. They believe in a mysterious and strange force abroad in the universe they call luck. They believe they're lucky. They believe when they buy a lottery ticket, they got a much better chance of winning than you or I. I'm not saying their belief is correct, what I'm saying is if you think about the other information I gave you, they're not going to buy loads of lottery tickets. They buy one ticket every week. There's a big clue there. If you were really trying to play the lottery to win lots of money and you had $290 million, you'd buy $1,000 worth of tickets every week, right, to up your chances. That would make statistical sense. $1,000 to them a week is no money at all. They don't do that. I told you they buy one ticket a week. I emphasize that. So I'm arguing right there was a big clue that they believe, given they can afford a lot of lottery tickets, they believe they don't have to buy anymore because they are lucky. Now, sorry about the hard time I gave you there, but there's a very important message embedded in this story, which is your belief about your destiny, your belief about the forces that govern your future are absolutely crucial to motivation. And there are only two possible beliefs you can actually have. You either believe your destiny is in your hands, that is if you work hard, practice at stuff, do stuff, turn up at lectures, try at various things, your destiny is under your control. You can determine the outcome. You want to go to medical school, you can determine whether you get into medical school by performing certain actions. You either believe your destiny, your future is in your hands, or you don't believe it's in your hands. In which case you believe you're the victim of circumstance. You believe that no matter how hard you work to get into medical school or whatever it is you want in life, your chances of getting it are slim to non-existent or not very good because many other forces are in play. And psychologists divide the two basic groups of people into being internals or externals. You're either an internal, internals believe their destiny is in their hands, they believe that they can achieve what they set out to because if they throw enough hard work at the problem or resources at the problem, they will achieve their outcome. Externals believe they're the victim of circumstance, they don't believe that they determine the outcome. So let's examine what happens when an internal and external go to a job interview. And, as unfortunately sometimes happens, they fail the job interview. The internal comes away from the failure of the job interview and takes responsibility for the outcome. They say, I failed the job interview because it's my fault. I wasn't good enough. I didn't have the right qualifications. I didn't study hard enough. I didn't perform well enough in the interview. I want you to notice something. That emotional valence of the experience of taking responsibility when bad things happen is horrible. 
It's horrible to come away from a job interview to fail it and say, it's my fault. It's a deeply unpleasant emotional experience. And that's why it's not popular. But in the long run, your chances of succeeding at job interviews arise if you take responsibility and say, I didn't work hard enough, it's my fault. Because then you go away, get over the setback, and overcome the emotional disturbance of the experience and study harder, get better qualifications, practice your job interview technique, be videoed, etc., etc. You do something about the problem. Let's examine what happens when an external fails a job interview. They're crying into their bear in the pub afterwards. Their friends say, how did it go? And this is what an external says. You know what? I didn't stand a chance from the beginning. They were against me from the minute I came into that room. I could detect it. They're biased, they're prejudiced, they're unfair, there's nepotism. They've got someone else in mind. It was just a show, showcase because they had someone else in mind. Externals do not take responsibility for bad things that happen to them. It's someone else's fault. It's not their fault. Now that is a great thing to say Within the first few hours of hearing you fail the job interview, that's a much emotionally better place to be. It's not my fault. But in the long run, it's a bad place to be in terms of motivation. I am not, by the way, saying that the answer to life, the universe, and everything is to be a highly motivated person. Being a highly motivated person comes with certain costs. We'll get to that. Um, uh, let me just stop that timer. So we're running out of time. Um, and we've got to take a uh, a short break. Um, but what I am saying is that if you want to be a highly motivated person, and there is a direct link between being a highly motivated person and being successful at things like weight loss, job success, pay rises, being better at friendship, etc., etc. If you want to be a highly motivated person, the starting point is are you internal or are you external? And the big failure at the heart of the motivation industry, and they're motivational gurus that will take your money quite happily uh, all over the world, is they don't start with that starting point. What are you? Are you internal or external? Because if you're external, you've got to move towards being more internal. Start with your kids who are very unmotivated, perhaps, which is are they internal or external? That's the key question to ask. And the, the way you get at that question is when bad things have happened to you before, whose fault was it? What you are looking for are people who take responsibility for the uncomfortable, difficult things that happen to them, which is a very rare thing in the world. Now, Jean Twenge, a uh, psychologist in the US, has been doing a thing called a meta-analysis. That's where you pool all the research done in a particular area. And she's done a meta-analysis of all the studies measuring the prevalence of internality and externality in the world since the early 1960s, when the concept was first developed. And if you Google Jean Twenge and my name and the Daily Telegraph, which are three things you have to Google, I wrote an article about this that's available free online about her research. Because what she's found is that younger generations, i.e. every generation since the early 60s, are moving dramatically personality-wise in a particular direction. I'm going to ask you the question, what do you think? Are they getting more internal or are they getting more external? What do you think? Everyone said external, which is very interesting. They are moving dramatically in an external direction. And again, what's really interesting, one source of conflict between generations, between you and younger people or your children, will be that they'll be a hell of a lot more external than you. And that's the source of conflict. One source of conflict between you and people in general, if you are internal, is the conflict arises from the fact you're dealing with an external person and vice versa. So get a sense when you're in conflict with someone, what are they? Are they internal or are they external? So I know we're running out of time, but I just want to finish this point before we then take a break. Um, one key question is why is this dramatic shift occurring? And the dramatic shift has dramatic social implications. Externals are much less likely to vote. To an external, what's the point of voting? I can make no difference to the world. There's no point in me voting. Internals tend to vote. They think their one vote could make a difference. Externals tend to take shortcuts. They tend to cheat. They don't regard working hard for exams at any point because they don't believe the world is a fair place. So they go for shortcuts. So rising crime levels, rising levels of apathy, rising levels of people not voting can all be explained by this shift towards externality. On the Today programme, a news programme on Radio 4, there are lots of interviews and debates, usually ex discussing some social phenomenon. Something's gone wrong. Uh, education system's gone wrong. Children aren't doing so well in schools anymore. Uh, rising crime levels in a particular neighborhood. Stabbings in London. Listen carefully for the explanations given as to why people do stuff. Because the explanations 
are always external. The reason why this person did the bad thing they did was because of the bad housing they were in, the terrible childhood they had, the terrible toilet training, the Freudian dad didn't give them, etc, etc, etc. And I am not saying it is not the case that external factors play an effect on people's lives. But when was the last time you heard someone say, the reason why that bad person, that person did the bad thing they did is because they chose to do it. Okay? The variable, the last variable, which is personal responsibility, is getting squeezed out by all the other variables. Um, so that's a deep problem in our society. We can't discuss personal responsibility. The reason you did the thing you did, which was the thing you shouldn't have done, was because you chose to do it, as opposed to the long list of external explanations, which detract from personal responsibility and stop you making the necessary steps to change and take responsibility for your life. So, Niall, I'm aware we're running out of time. I just want to make one final point, then we'll close for the break. So, um, why, why is this happening? Um, one theory is the rise of social science explanation. Uh, what psychiatrists and psychologists do, they excuse your behavior because they find an explanation which takes you away from, you've got to take personal responsibility for your life. The other really interesting theory is, uh, the two other interesting theories are what's called the big news theory. The big news theory is you turn on the TV at night, you watch terrible events from all over the world, flooding in Pakistan, earthquake in Bangladesh, and you feel overwhelmed by the idea the big world's happening out there and you can make no difference to it. 250 years ago, there was no big TV news. The only news was local news. You leaned over a garden fence, your neighbor told you something about some other neighbor was doing something, and it was local community news that you could do something about. So we are overwhelmed by big TV news. And so that's one argument that you should just stick to, largely speaking, not always, but get more involved in your community because you will feel more empowered about local issues that you can do something about. One final theory is the rise of blame culture. Blame culture goes something like this. You step out your front door, you trip over a broken paving stone, and you uh, nearly break your leg. And all of a sudden, as you're trying to get up and brush yourself down, all of a sudden, a lawyer will appear out of nowhere and press their card into your arm and say, let me sue the local council for you, for how dare they leave this broken paving stone here designed to trip you up. This is always happening to me at cocktail parties. Lawyers are coming up to me and say, Dr. Pasord, here's my card. I can't help but noticing your expanding girth suggests we should sue McDonald's because clearly they're at fault for why you are growing bigger and bigger. So uh, the rise of blame culture. So uh, we're going to close there. We're going to take a brief break. Then I'm going to show you another, do another test. I'm going to show you a bit of video. I'm going to ask you a question about the motivation of the people involved. Thank you very much indeed. If you want further resources on what I'm talking about, there's a book I wrote called The Motivated Mind. You can buy that from Amazon. Um, and also there's a free app called Raj Pursuit in Conversation. It's completely free. It's me interviewing experts, top experts from all around the world on subjects like this one. And the interviews are quite in depth. They go on for over an hour quite a lot of the time. So the trouble with a lot of interviews you see in the media where people are being interviewed, they're interviewed for a way too short a period of time to get at the, the deep issues they're trying to explain. And there is a very interesting interview with a guy who's written a book recently, he's a top sports athlete, uh, psychologist, motivator, about um, uh, the principles of how you get people to start doing something uh, they've always been putting off. I know you had a talk on procrastination earlier, but he has some very interesting ideas on that one. But that's, uh, the app is called Raj Persuading Conversation. It's free, it's on iTunes, and it's um, uh, on Android, Google Play. And it, it's completely free. It's audio only uh, podcast. So you can listen to it while you're commuting to work. So uh, we've got a lot to rush through in the, the last bit. I'm going to show you a clip of video. Um, and I'm going to ask you, because you know every, every story I tell you has got a psychology test. So I did warn you. Um, and, and the answers are embedded in the story. So this is a film uh, called Swingers. It's not about what you think it's about. <laughs> It's a film uh, made quite a long time ago. It's a comedy. It's about um, these two central characters who are basically young men in their early 20s. They've gone to Hollywood like a lot of American young men do. They're trying to make it big in Hollywood. They're trying to be actors or stand-up comedians or in the entertainment business. And um, they are failing, by and large. They're going to auditions and being rebuffed. Um, there's quite a funny moment where one of the um, uh, friends says, why, why, why did they have to put me up for... And he mentioned some D Disney character, I think Pluto, um, when he was auditioning for Hamlet uh, a few uh, auditions ago. So they're failing. But so what do young men do with a lot of time on their hands? But they go to bars and they try to pick up women, basically. So um, the film is, is about um, uh, the fact that this guy and his friends, um, and you'll see, um, are, are very manipulative, calculating, scheming 
uh, confident, and so they constantly chatting women up in bars. Um, this guy, who you'll see again in, in the clip we're about to see, has just broken up from a long-standing girlfriend, and his friends are concerned about him because he seems to be resolutely single and morose and upset and mourning the, the past uh, the, the past girlfriend. So his his friends are out there plotting and scheming to pick women up in bars, keep push, trying to push him to, to chat girls up. And, and unfortunately, his standard tactic, because he's much more sincere than these other guys, is when he meets a girl to start talking about his ex-girlfriend, which, not a great tactic, uh, really. But he's just being sincere, he's just upset and depressed and downloading, and it's not, it's not a great pickup line or, or way to charm people when you've just met them. So the scene you're about to see is they've arrived in a bar. They, hilariously, unfortunately, um, you're, they all arrive, although they're a group of about eight guys, they all arrive separately in their own cars because they're hoping to get lucky and, and drive someone home afterwards. So there's a hilarious bit where they all turn up in their own cars, even though they could all get there together, you know. Um, anyway, and uh, you will see that immediately um, they, they spring into action in terms of plotting and scheming who in the bar uh, they're going to go and chat up. And... Um, uh, th this guy, though, is disillusioned, disenchanted, and upset, and, and has very little self-esteem in his ability to pick women up. So he, he does a real, um, he, he's a bit despairing, sitting there in the bar, watching everyone else in action, and feeling a bit lonely. Well, I won't spoil what happens next, so you're going to see what happens. But what I want, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you about, there are a lot of things happen in, in, these, in this scene. There's a roller coaster ride of emotion. I'm going to ask you about people's motivations. In each dialogue you see, what is the motivation behind the key principal characters. Why are they saying what they're saying? Why are they doing what they're doing? So it's a test about your ability to get your head around uh, other people's motivation. And there's a lot of different conversations that happen, some of them are quite rapid fire, um, but I want you to be thinking, although you may get yourself lost a little bit in the clip. Um, and uh, then we'll, we'll, we'll stop the clip at the end. Um, I love this clip. I love the way they go through a relationship, well, he does, uh, by himself on an answering machine. <laughs> And I love the bit where he goes, um, uh, it's not working out. I think we need to take a break from each other. Um, so, okay, so there are lots of different things that happen in this clip. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Of course, psychiatrists are in grave danger of overanalyzing uh, movies and clips. And some of the things I may say may have nothing to do with what the actors or the director intended to say. But I like to use clips to discuss behavior. Because one of the big failings of academic psychology and psychiatry, they give you PowerPoint demonstration after PowerPoint demonstration with lots of data and numbers. But what we're actually trying to talk about is behavior. And movie clips allow us to discuss actual behavior. So again, sorry to be very provocative and challenging, but any academic who stands up in front of you and doesn't show you a piece of behavior to discuss, I'm afraid I'm very suspicious about, because they're not making the correct transition from data in the laboratory, which I think is very important, to real life situations. Um, I can't go around filming people in real life situations and show it to you, that would be unethical, but I can use movie clips, which give us a sense of what happens in uh, real life. So the first point I would make is there's no doubt in anyone's mind, this guy, when he gets back to his flat, is highly motivated. So it's a good example of where being highly motivated can backfire. No one disputes the fact he's very driven, but interestingly, that very drive backfires. Why is that? One of the reasons for that is he's so preoccupied with his own internal state, he comes back to the flat, there's just been an incident which has disturbed him, the incident outside the bar where there, someone pushed someone, there was a bit of an argument, and then it ended with someone accusing him of basically not having balls, and it was a very desperate moment for him. He was attacked by his friend who criticized him. So he leaves that scene and arrives now in the flat. Would he have made the phone call if that incident hadn't happened outside the bar, is a key question. Was there a sense in which that phone call was galvanized by that chiding remark his friend said um, about how about his behavior and interesting the friend made a, a prophetic prediction he said i know you got her number tonight but you're going to screw it up okay and he didn't listen to that because actually that was a, a, pro a prophecy that turned out uh, to be correct so emotional disturbance well, maybe his motivation ultimately was to deal with his emotional disturbance at that moment, and he wasn't thinking, which is what you have to think about in relationships, which is about the other person. The other person at the end of hearing all these 12 different RCBC messages would, would come to a conclusion 
about him, which is not, not flattering, and he's not thinking that way. Why is he not thinking that way? Because his own internal state is of such strong emotion is dominating the way he's thinking about the world, and that ultimately backfires on him. Now, the other really interesting moment, I think, and there are many interesting moments in this, in this clip, is he gets... He has an unfortunate conversation with the girl. He's trying to pretend he's a, he's a successful comic. He's trying to learn from his friends who, who say that kind of stuff in order to um, uh, pick up women in, in bars. So he, he's not very good at it. You can see that he was having a go at saying, I'm a successful comic. And then the, 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 the girl says, oh, I remember you. Yes, you came in and asked for an application form for a job at Starbucks. And he is crushed by the fact that she's seen through him. And he leaves... Uh, with his tail between the legs. Now, the, this is a very interesting moment because he's upset and deflated. The two friends are basically trying to have a motivational conversation with him to motivate him to get back in there. And I think this is really interesting because, in a way, they're doing a bit of amateur psychology. Okay? And what is the method they use? It's a hilarious conversation they have. They say, you're a bear, you've got claws, you're batting the rabbit around. It was a bizarre, very strange conversation. What are they trying to do? What's the... What's the tactic here? They're trying a couple of very interesting things. They're trying to say, uh, uh, amongst other things, that you can do this. They're trying to G him up, and they're using emotion. They're trying to reassure him. They're trying to G him up and say, you can do this, okay? And they have a very, very um, intense conversation. Now, no, no academic psychologist would say what they said to a guy in that situation. But one of the things they had going for them, I think, although it was a bizarre series of statements they made, was that they just felt really strongly for him. And maybe he could detect that. Maybe he could detect the fact his friends were on his side. And his friends in saying, get back in there, get back in there, maybe that was what motivated him. It was the social support he got from his two friends, although they were saying really bizarre stuff, uh, to be honest. Now, another really interesting thing happens just before he goes back in, the friend pulls him aside, the other friend goes back and he says, now listen, I want you to not be the guy in the, in, the, in the movie that everyone's rooting for. I want you to be the guy that everyone's not really certain about. Now, it was, again, it was a bizarre series of statements. It's not entirely clear what he's trying to say, but what he is trying to say is, and he, do, he does it in a veiled manner, is don't care so much about this. Be the guy that doesn't care so much. You care too much, and because you care too much, you're, you're overly anxious, and because you're overly anxious, it doesn't, it doesn't go right. Now, he doesn't say exactly that in those words. I, that's my interpretation of what he's trying to say, but what I like about this is he's using a metaphor. So he, says, he uses a thing. He accesses the idea of a movie. Be the guy in that movie. He's trying to find common ground in terms of a common experience. And one of the big failings in academic psychology when it tries to motivate people and uses data and experiments, it doesn't use story. What I've done today is I've told you a lot of stories. It, you were having a, a talk earlier about memory and how people remember things. People remember stories. So one of the reasons I tell stories and then embed a piece of information in them is that people will remember the story and then they'll remember the information. If I just told you about Gene Twenge's research and hadn't told you the story beforehand, you would not remember Gene Twenge. I'm willing to bet you've got a much better chance of remembering the internal external distinction because of the Stephen and Pat Roberts story. So one of the key tensions between the academic world, which is focused on data and numbers, and moves away from the world of fiction, Netflix, etc., etc., is that you need to bring both to the party. You need to bring storytelling to the party, in my, in my opinion. And when you're trying to motivate some, someone, a story of some description, a story they can identify with, is extremely important. There was the kernel of a genius idea when he said, I want you not to be the guy in the rated R movie who's like this, but this other guy. He's accessing at a deep level the way this other guy was thinking about character, motivation, and story. And that is a much better way, in my opinion, uh, to, to help people uh, become motivated. So I didn't agree with the, the basic content of, of a lot of what he said, which did, didn't make sense. Um, there was also something quite interesting and slightly sinister going on there in that there were demeaning women, um, in the sense that, you know, you're a bear with claws, it's a bunny rabbit, you're bunny the bunny. So what was interesting, though, there was a psychological tactic there, in, and you can see a lot of times this happens with, with um, 
in, in, in relationships. That in order for people to get confidence to enter a situation, they have to demean the other party in some way. I don't agree with that tactic, but I can see to some extent the psychology uh, behind that. I don't think that's a great idea that you demean the opposite sex in order to help you enter the world and take the risk of being rebuffed by them. But I understand uh, the psychology uh, behind that. So I want you to think a little bit about how you would have motivated that guy to go back in there and have another go uh, with the girl. What would you have said or done? Because again, that's the heart of motivation, not just your own motivation. A lot of what you're going to do in life as a parent, as a manager, as a friend, is motivate people. Um, and I want you to think about what they did in that situation. Now again, there's quite an interesting scene at the beginning where he gets the phone number and he comes back and he's basically um, asking advice because he's really a bit lost. And I love the advice they gave him. So first he said, how long should I wait before ringing? And one guy says, a day. And he says, okay, so I'll ring tomorrow. He said, no, no, no. You, after tomorrow, then a day. And then the two of them have a conversation with each other about when is the correct time to ring. And I love the line, well, I think two days is the industry standard. I think that's a great <laughs> phrase. So my first question to you is why do they start having a conversation with each other about the correct number of days? Because they move away a little bit from the guy's first question, which was, when, when should I call? And they, they get lost a little bit in their own debate about when, when to call. Any, any thoughts about that? Anyone want to have a go? They see themselves as the industry. Sorry, who, who, who's? Yeah, that's right. They see themselves as the expert of the industry, and they're trying to get to an agreement between them what is basically. Okay, so you're saying it's almost like an academic conversation. What is the correct number of days? Okay, that's one possibility. But I encourage you guys to think about alternative motivations. There's a lady, a gen, a, a gentleman there. Okay, by stretching out the number of days. You see, I think that's going to make him more anxious. Because he's, he's so anxious, he rings at 2.30 in the morning. And they're making him more anxious by dragging out the number of days. He's already, he's already quite anxious. He comes back to the table and says, when should I call? And they go one day, he goes, oh, I'll call tomorrow then. That's a clue this guy's anxious. So what do they then do? They stretch out the number of days, which is making him, by the way, more anxious, I think, which is one of the reasons I think he calls at 2.30. He couldn't face the prospect of waiting six days. Is, is, so that's another example, my argument is, as to what's going on there. There's another chapter in front of you. Yeah, uh, maybe they're not confident about uh, their own answer, so they're trying to sort of navigate the world. So, so talking out is probably one way to kind of uh, navigate so you think they're anxious about yes. girls? Yeah, they're not sure about their okay. own answer, so, so well, I, I put it to you that that conversation they had was one where they were looking remarkably arrogant uh, about, about the correct number of days. The, the very fact they have a theory which is the correct number of days, I thought was a tad arrogant. And then when analyzing their own success in terms of days, like, yeah. <laughs> do I get results at four days or six days? Yes. And I'll, well, see, I think that's what their motivation is. They're showing off. They're showing off that we're so casual with girls, we can wait six days, it's, it makes no difference. And when we recorded the sixth day, the girl's still interested. Um, any sensible girl, of course, would tell them to go and stuff it. They're gonna wait six days uh, to make a call because, in, a, in a manipulative, calculating manner. But I think at that moment, their motivation shifts from helping the guy, and it's quite an interesting shift, because they were trying to be helpful to begin with, then they get lost in showing off to each other about who knows best. And they do do that quite a lot. So I want you to notice something quite important. It's a shift that happens very quickly and subtly. To begin with, they were trying to help the guy. Then they start showing off to each other. Okay? And I want you to notice, I'm not saying I'm right. One of the problems of psychology and psychiatry, you can never know for certain what's going on inside people's heads. But be aware that the motivation that began at the beginning of a conversation is not necessarily the motivation at the end. And there's a famous con man's technique called bait and switch. Bait and switch is you think this person is being very kind and understanding, and the conversation begins that way, so you develop a certain view as to their motivation, and actually, at the end of the conversation, something else is going on, and you haven't detected that a new motivation has arrived. So again, another idea that's very important here, it is not the case that all conversations begin with the same motivation and end with the same motivation. Maybe something else happens. I think, I'm interested in your opinion, anyone who violently disagrees, please feel free to take issue, they begin to show off to each other, and the motivation now has changed. Um, now, another question. He likes to ventilate about um, the, um, the, the ex-girlfriend. And, and notice that the argument that happens outside the bar, someone says, um, you know, you got left by someone who left you um, a year ago, and you're still going on about it. And he says, no, it wasn't a year, it was six months. Okay, so in his attempt to correct the number, the number of time, he's missed the point. The point is, you're going on about it way too long. 
So if someone's telling him something, why is he not picking up on that? What's going on there motivationally? People are telling him, you go on too much about your ex-girlfriend. Why is he not? He does it again on the answering machine within three phone calls. He, you know, the reason I'm acting kind of weird, I just got out of this long-standing relationship. What? This is a very common human tendency to go on and on about something, and it's not going to get you anywhere. So why is he doing it? Why do people do that? Right. It's not over, over the thing yet. Yes. For sure. So he keeps going on about it. Maybe because he has sort of a secret hope that he can fix it. Or maybe he's seeking for support rather than being over it. Yeah. Well, he's clearly not over it because, as you say, one sign people aren't over something, they go on and on about it, right? But. But what's he thinking is going to happen by going? Because all that's happening is he's cheesing people off around him, not just the girlfriend. I think the friends are getting a bit exasperated with him. And I think that's why they're so desperate he's successful with a girl. That's one of the reasons that conversation, at a deep level, their agitation is, Jesus, I hope he just picks someone up sooner or later, because he's really dreary to have around. I think that's another dark motivation that's going on. Yes, they began by wanting to be friendly and, and helpful, but after a while, it's dreary to have someone going on and on and on. So now they get desperate that he, that he picks someone up. He was a liar. Yes. He was yeah. a liar in front of the lady. Yes, that's true, yes. But I want to go back to the question, why do people go on and on and on about something when we can all see from, it's not getting you anywhere, it's just cheesing other people off. Still his reality. Sorry? Still his reality. Yes. It may be your reality, but if you're going to be in the world and be with friends, you have to think about, I want to be looked after. He's, he's asking to be looked after by the world, but you have to look after the world as well. Sometimes people, when need, are desperate to be looked after, they're so absorbed by their need to be looked after, they didn't look after their friends, and as a result, they get um, alienated or rebuffed by their friends. Someone else? Someone else? Yes. So this is an interesting point about the external mindset. Um, there's a sense in which he has to ask a very uncomfortable question about the predicament he's in. He got dumped by this girl. He's still single. What's that about? What's going on? All his friends are out there picking women up right, left and centre. So he's left to face a very uncomfortable question. And I think he's having difficulty facing it. Again, it's the heart of human psychology, having to confront a difficult issue, which is he needs to maybe make a change. Okay? That's what he needs to do. And he's avoiding that possibility. At the heart of our lives, when we face problems, we like to spend our time ventilating and complaining about the problem. Ultimately, I'm sorry to break this news to you, therapy is about a deep point, which is you are going to have to make a change. And we're so desperate to not make that change that we do all sorts of other things, complain, etc., etc. Yes, well, uh, well, I think we're discussing the fact that people do a lot of displacement activity um, rather than confront some things. The, g the guys are out there casually, Machiavellianly, manipulatively, coolly, schemingly picking up girls right, left and centre. They're, they're running away from something as well, I, I think. May maybe they're having a ball, I'm not sure. But I also think they're running away from something, a, a better relationship. I mean, the way they were demeaning women by the thing about the bunny and so on suggests that they've got a slightly screwed up attitude to women, I think, in, in my opinion. I mean, I'm not saying that the scriptwriters were thinking about that. So anyway, we're running out of time very quickly. There's one, I, mean, I meant to leave for time questions. There's one last point I want to make, and then we'll um, take some questions and answers. So how do we get at motivation, given, given this, this deep problem I made the point, and we discussed this? And there's a very nice technique called the perfect day exercise I want to share with you. So the perfect day exercise, where you ask someone to describe their most perfect day. It's not a good day you want to be described. You want 
a perfect day. What a perfect day means is when we discuss the day and the rules of the game are you have 24 hours, I give you a blank check, you could spend any amount of money you like, you could do anything you like, and you could even play a little bit fast and loose with geography. I'm going to give you an example of a perfect day that a client told me. Um, but what I want to hear about is perfection. I don't want to hear about a really good day, I want to hear what a perfect day would look like. And the tyranny behind the idea of perfection is that we can't improve the day. We take something out, put something in, you can't improve the day. So the rules of the game has to be 24 hours. I'm not discussing a perfect week or a perfect month or a perfect hour. A perfect day, you have a blank check. You could do anything you like in the perfect day. There are no holds barred in terms of resources available to you. What would look like perfection? So here's an example. A client came to me, and I have his permission to, to discuss, although I will disguise details to protect confidentiality. He was a very successful man, had achieved all his goals in his life, and uh, wanted now to be a novelist. And being a completer, he was always very successful, it was somewhat of a surprise to him that he couldn't finish writing a novel. He must have started but not finished about 20 novels. He was perplexed. He came to me and said, what's happening? What's wrong with my motivation? I want to finish the novel and publish it. And I'm normally a completer. I normally succeed at all my goals. What's going wrong? So I asked him to do the perfect day exercise. Here's his perfect day. In his perfect day, he wakes up on his own private Caribbean island. So a good place to start your perfect day is where would you wake up? Who would you wake up with? You'd be amazed how few times people tell me they wake up with their husband or wife. <laughs> or that they wake up with just one person. That's also in people's perfection idea. Okay. And by the way, at the end of the perfect day, I go, but what, what happened to your husband or wife? And they go, I knew I'd forgotten something. <laughs> Okay, so um, he wakes up at his own private Caribbean island. Very interestingly, he wakes up alone. And uh, another, another interesting thing about the perfect day exercise is we want little details. The details make the day. So women often tell me, um, I wake up and the bed has, and they say something like this, they ha the bed has Egyptian cotton sheets. So women are very hot in the interior design detail of where they wake up. No guy ever tells me that. Okay, about the, the interior design details. So he wakes up, his own private Caribbean island, he's on a villa, the villa's on the beach, and he hears the lapping of the waves on the coral white Caribbean sea. That's how he wakes up. That's the noise he wakes up to. So that little sensual detail is extremely important to the perfect day exercise. That's what makes the perfect day come alive. So bobbing gently at the edge of a pier is his own private seaplane. Now the other rules about the private perfect day exercise is you don't you can have any skill or talent in your perfect day that you don't have in real life. That's allowed. So in real life, he didn't have a private pilot's license, but in his perfect day, he flies planes So um, for, as a hobby. So he gets into his, his, uh, his um, uh, private seaplane. By the way, another good question is, what time do you wake up on your perfect day? You'll be amazed about the number of people. I've given them a blank check. I've told them, you can do anything you like, be with anyone in the world. And some of them say, I wake up late on my perfect day. That tells me volumes. If your idea of perfection, wake up at 11 a.m. in the morning, what is that telling you about someone? Okay, so most people, if you have a perfect day, wake up early, because they want to use as much of the day as possible. He gets in this private seaplane, he flies to a neighboring private Caribbean island, and he has breakfast with the Spice Girls. Now, <laughs> This dates this perfect day to a certain era when the Spice Girls were top of the charts. So you get a sense of how old this perfect day is. Uh, I will now draw a veil over the more pornographic elements of this man's <laughs> perfect day. But basically, he cavorts with the Spice Girls most of the morning and has breakfast with them. He then flies in the Spice Girls' own private Learjet to Rio de Janeiro, where in the closing seconds of a tensely fought World Cup soccer final, he scores the winning goal in extra time for England against Brazil. He is fated by the, the national press. By the way, I can hear groans. It's very important you don't judge other people's perfect day. What, the reason I'm giving you this guy's perfect day was he was clearly completely immune to judgment. And that's very important, that you should be able to describe a perfect day that is perfection for you, regardless of what anyone else might think. If you start describing a perfect day which you are delivering because you think it's what other people think you ought to want, that is not actually the point of the exercise. The whole point of the exercise is what would be perfection for you, okay? So he flies, um, for having scored the winning goal in his 
uh, the, the, the front page news and all the red top uh, newspapers. He flies by another private jet to New York. Now, I, I know we're playing fast and loose with geography, and you may not be able to fit all of these things in. You're allowed to stretch time and, and compress distance a little bit in your perfect day, but I won't allow it to continue for day after day after day. Just on this occasion, I let him have New York, the Caribbean, and Brazil, though I agree it was stretching it a bit. He flies by jet to um, uh, New York, um, uh, uh, waiting on a tarmac of a private aerodrome is a possibly long stretch white limousine. So he steps from the steps of the airplane into the limousine without his feet touching the ground. I love that detail that he put in there. Um, the, the limousine drives him to an ultra exclusive New York nightclub. The queue to get in the nightclub starts to develop several miles before they get to the nightclub. They're passing people in his white limousine uh, queuing to get into the nightclub. At the nightclub, there's a roped off area. A man in a peak cap unhooks the ropes, let this man in straight away, and he dances the night away with the very peculiar feature of this nightclub. It's full of nothing but supermodels. Just him and supermodels. We were going to get back to supermodels sooner or later. I know I started off that way. OK, so here's the question. I've just described this man's perfect day. His perfect day explains perfectly, in my opinion, why he can't finish novels. Anyone want to have a go at why, why the perfect day tells us that? Why can't he finish novels? <laughs> Sorry, because he's not interested in writing. Yeah. How do you know that from his perfect day? Yes. Very good. That's, a, that's the correct answer. Again, a lot of people tell me all sorts of other answers, like he's too busy, he's too active. There is nothing literary about this man's perfect day. He tells me he's driven to write books. He doesn't wake up in a book-lined room. He doesn't get a phone call from Penguin saying your book is top of the New York bestseller list. There is nothing literary. So how do we square this circle? He tells me he wants to write books. He describes a perfect day where books don't feature at all. Okay? Well, I'll tell you how we square the circle. He wants what books will deliver. The themes of his perfect day are wealth, fame, power, sex. Okay? Well, he wants a book that delivers that. Here's the key point. He doesn't really care how he gets wealth, fame, power, and sex. He just wants it delivered. And that's why he can't finish a novel, because he was caught in an internal, key term coming up, goal conflict. One goal was to write a book that impressed the London Literary Establishment, that got a favorable review in the London Literary Review or the London Review of Books. But his other goal was to write a book that gave him a private Caribbean island. That's a difficult goal to reconcile. The kind of Harold Robbins potboiler airport bestseller that gives you a private Caribbean island is not the kind of book that gets a positive review from the London Review of Books. He had to reconcile the goal conflict. And the perfect day illuminated the goal conflict perfectly. Because the perfect day is a sneaky way of getting at what you really want. If you say to people, what do you really want? They just tell you what they think they ought to want. I want to help look after small kittens, etc., etc. The perfect day is a sneaky way. You should try it with a date one evening. It's a very sneaky way of getting at what you really want. Okay? And what he really wanted was sex, fame, power, money. I don't mind that. I just want him to understand that's what he really wants. And the book's just a vehicle to get him there, as illustrated by his perfect day. OK, um, we're going to think about closing very shortly. So let's do some questions and answers. And there's a microphone, a roving mic. Um, any uh, questions? And there's, a, there's a lady there. Over there. What is that? Oh, there's a lady over there. Let's go with her first. <laughs> well, while we're waiting for her, why don't you ask your question? I wanted to know why you chose this film. Meaning you don't like the film? I didn't say that. <laughs> but I'm thinking about the motivation behind your question. I want to know what motivated you to choose this film for your lecture. OK, so it was a clip. It's not the whole film. It was a clip from the film. But I think the clip illustrates quite nicely some of the key issues in motivation. One is where the two guys are trying to motivate the man to go back and chat the girl up. I thought it was a nice moment of how most people are trying their best to motivate other people, how they go about doing it, etc., uh, etc. Et well, well, I even disagree about that. I mean, it seemed to me they wanted him to do what they couldn't do themselves. Possibly, possibly. They wanted him to be like them because he's actually sincere and they're insincere. I don't disagree with that. But it's a good talking point. You don't have to like the film. The film is meant to stimulate no, 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 uh, a conversation about motivation. Yeah, but let's, let's get some other questions. Other people want to, this lady wants to ask a question? Yep.
Yes, people are always telling me, good question. Let's get the microphone to the next question. Um, who, who wants to answer the next question so we save time? Who wants to answer the next question? Will I answer this one? Oh, there's a lady at the back there. Uh, okay, so people are always telling me someone isn't motivated. Okay, again, apologies. I, I warned you about my style, which is to be direct and, and difficult. It's not true. What happens is people are not motivated by the thing you want them to be motivated by. They're motivated by something. When people tell me someone's not motivated, I then ask, well, are they sitting in a pool of urine, not doing anything at all? Because I don't think so. Instead, ask, what are they motivated to do? People are always coming and telling me they're teenagers are not motivated. No, they're motivated to do something else. They're playing Xbox. They're on their phones. They're very motivated. It's motivated by the wrong thing. So it's the wrong question. The question is, why are they not motivated by the things you'd like them to be motivated by or what they ought to be motivated? And the way to get at helping pe motivate people is find out what they're already motivated by, because that gives you a big clue. And you use that as the way in. Um, some parents brought a kid to see me who was a football genius, Arsenal, Barcelona, Real Madrid. He was only 14 years old. They were all courting him. He was going to be the next big thing. And they were tearing their hair out because he wouldn't study his GCSEs. Okay, because he didn't see the point because he was going to earn hundreds of millions being the next David Beckham. So to him, what was the point of doing maths and English? And I said to him, and we did a bit of theatre, storytelling, I think, as part of my, I said, it's lovely to meet you, um, but listen, um, I, I'm really sorry. I just left it hanging there. And it was a long story. He said, sorry about what? I said, I'm sorry about the fact you are going to earn a lot of money, not for yourself, but for your agent. And they're going to send their kids to private schools and swan around in private yachts, and you're going to be working very hard without very much money. And he said, what are you talking about? How's that going to happen? And I said, because they're going to shaft you because you won't be able to read the contract and do the mass. You're going to get shafted right, left and centre all your life, no matter what way the football is. Because if you can't read and write, the world is full of sharks circling to make money out of you. He left the consultation and did his GCSEs in maths and English. How come? What happened? I thought about his motivation. What was he motivated by? He got annoyed about the idea of working for other people and that galvanized him. Start with a question. People are not motivated. They're, just, they're motivated by something because they're not sitting around in a pool of urine starving to death. They're, they're doing something. They're just not doing what you'd like them to do. And that's a good starting point. Okay, there was a, a question at the back there. So, yes, that's a very good question. So, um, a lot of patients ask me this. And uh, I'm not saying you're a patient. I'm just saying a lot of patients <laughs> ask me that. And um, this is going to sound very, very sick. Um, uh, not in the way you're thinking. But um, I actually would, as part of my perfect day, see a patient. Patients find that a bit hard to believe. I actually enjoy seeing patients. Would I spend the whole day seeing patients? No. But I would see at least one patient uh, in the day. And that's a clue that I'm motivated and enjoy uh, what I do. Um, I, I would do lots of other things. I've just come here um, from playing in a beach tennis tournament uh, in uh, the Isle of Wight. So I love doing lots of activities. I'm a very competitive person. Um, uh, uh, I'm UK ranked men's number 17 in beach tennis. People are always very impressed with that in bars. I don't know why. Um, uh, more so than me saying I'm, I'm a top Harley Street consultant. When I told my wife I'm UK ranked men's number 17 in beach tennis, the first thing she said to me was, how many men actually play beach tennis in the UK? Is it 15, she said, which I, which I thought was somewhat harsh. Okay, so in, for part of my perfect day would involve me playing a sport. I play lots of sports maybe beach tennis, and me winning something. So part of my perfect day would be actually uh, win the Isle of Wight tournament that we just played in. I, didn't, I, w I won a few matches, but I didn't um, uh, win anything enough to be um, getting a medal. So that th there would be some of the elements uh, that would be in my perfect day. But what is important, when I, and I know this sounds a bit sickly, is that the fact that I was still a bit patient, helping someone overcome some difficulty would be part of my perfect day. Now, when I catch people out and I say, well, listen, you didn't put this or didn't put that in their perfect day, they always say, this, yeah, but I'd be taking a break from all that. And uh, I was having a holiday, then I'd go back to that. I do think it's really interesting if people don't put in the things that they think, um, like that, 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 their day job, I don't mind if people don't put that in, but, but it is revealing that often people say, yes, but I, I was gonna thinking of doing that some other time. The perfect day should have all the key elements of the things you enjoy doing the most, I think. Um, were there any other questions? 
Yeah, but I only give you a few elements of my, of my perfect day. <laughs> uh, good, good counterpoint, though. Uh, but I, I, only, I didn't go into the full details of my perfect day. I was doing what the classic thing psychiatrists do, which is not fully answer uh, the question. Um, OK, there's a, there's a question down here. Oh, we, we're out of time? Yeah, I'm going to hang around a little bit outside for another five or ten minutes. Yes. Can I just quickly want to say that I've written a book called The Motivated Mind. You get it from Amazon. There's the free app you can download called Raj Pursuit in Conversation. And there's a Psychology Today blog that I write regularly for that you can find as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.